Sorry, I'm waiting for some more people to wander back in again. Our schedule's just a bit off. My good husband has excellent information. And yes, we have been working together for 43 years. Side by side, we still talk to each other nicely. <laughs> most, of the, most of the time. No, but we are a good team. Oh, I don't need my mask. I really don't want to start until some more people walk in, so I apologize. You do it. You can. We know that. Carla, Carla will do the trick. <laughs> She's great. Watch out, Carla. <laughs> Thank you, Carla. You're corralling people. I don't want to start until a few more come in, if you don't mind. Nah, then I have to repeat some stuff, I think. Beyond the absence of disease and the absence of symptoms. With Dr. Herbert Benson in the mid-80s, he and his team, the ones that established the Institute of Mind-Body Medicine, it kind of forgot the human spirit. And there's that important component, but I've shifted to biobehavioral. So what does that mean? It is a, an awkward six-syllable term that really means all of our behaviors affect and change our total biology. In other words, all our daily lifestyle behaviors, um, eating patterns, appropriate physical activity and fitness techniques, uh, important relationships and interactions with others, and our sleep patterns and sleep habits, and everyday relaxation response practices, which I'm gonna explain can make a change in gene expression to inhibit cancer-promoting factors. All of those together change our microenvironment to a healing environment. So yes, a systematic biobehavioral program, as I mentioned and I will repeat, is essential to enhanced medical outcomes. It equips patients to make changes in every person's microenvironment that are biochemical, molecular, and metabolic, making the body, as I mentioned, inhospitable to further disease <clears throat> and more capable of fostering genuine health. And I deliberately use the word inhospitable because that's my non-MD term. I have a good friend, or we have a good friend who is a PhD and he reminds us we're NARDs, N-A-R-D, not actually the real doctor but I have been working alongside this wonderful doctor, Keith Block, he and I, um, developing the whole system as he explained. And they're not just complementary add-ons to what is normally considered, unfortunately, in many centers, the real medicine or just conventional care. This is a whole program with increased benefits when people actually can bring together all these seemingly separate components. So, yes, every patient who comes to us gets a patient healing guide, and Keith started to refer to the fundamentals. Um, and I have kept that patient healing guide in seemingly separate components. Again, I can, will continue to tell you how they all interconnect with increased synergistic benefits. Um, it's like that old-fashioned statement, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. But I do want to focus on some of the specifics and mention that, yes, we have individualized 
dietary recommendations that are made. There are some general guidelines staying away from uh, meat and poultry because even if they're hormone-free, chemical-free, inherent in those categories of animal protein are inflammatory promoters. And we know inflammation is implicated highly in these different cancers and many medical issues. Um, we also, and this is hard for some people, is we urge people to stay away from dairy products. And of course, Keith laughingly has referred to me as the former dairy queen, and I admit, confess, I used to think I was doing the right thing by making my own yogurt, but I had to have those wonderful international cheeses every day. I made these changes actually before I met him, but when I told him, yeah, he called me the former dairy queen. But the issue with dairy products that come from cow's milk or goat's milk, those mammalian milks, is even if we get hormone-free, chemical-free, and inherent in those, among other things, is insulin-like growth factor. And IGF-1 makes those baby cows grow fast naturally on the mama cow's milk, but it's highly correlated with growth factors in cancer. So today there are alternative cheeses. They're not fake. They just use other ingredients that are processed like a cheese. And then we humans are born with a natural preference for sweet. I don't mean we're born with a natural preference for Benison's Bakery. But yes, and having some sweet and sweet treats is not a bad thing. Um, about six years ago in doing a paper with um, our research manager, and of course Keith's involvement, but I had done, written up and added monk fruit to the list of sweeteners. Monk fruit is a mistranslation of the traditional Chinese. In other words, um, there were these Goquan monks that maybe 100, 200 years ago had found a healing property in this fruit-like food. So what sweetens monk fruit is not fructose, but a mogricide, which is an antioxidant. Then there is some erythritol added which is not an artificial sweetener. It's the only safe itol. It's not like sorbitol or xylitol. It won't adversely impact the GI tract. And by the way, we all know that sugar doesn't cause cancer, but of course those cancer cells guzzle the sugar probably 30 to 40 fold more rapidly than healthy cells. So we don't want to feed the sugar, but having nice treats is also a nice treat for us. But, um, and then, um, there are two categories of foods. While most of the focus in the dietary program are on foods to avoid and preferred options, and I'm sorry about my raspy voice. It's been a little dry inside, so forgive me. Um, but um, the, there are two categories of foods, and one woman asked me, why do you keep those more exotic foods in the dietary program? Well, one example is a naturally fermented long-term aged miso puree. Um, and I mention that because fermented soy actually is a whole different creature than the non-fermented, and there are many advantages. And I will mention the kind of miso that's been aged a year and a half to three years because inherent in that, first of all, is one of the best combinations of pro and prebiotics, which we all know we need for healthy microbiome or those hundreds of trillions of cells that make up a good digestive process. There's also a property in that miso that's a darker brown than some of the blonde misos. And it is xybilicin, which was found to help eliminate some of the unwanted after effects of radiation exposure. And even if people are not receiving radiation, there is exposure. Number three, it's one of the best whole foods for restoring healthy flora. And there are many ways we deplete flora. Um, treatments, tension, stress, um, because we have more neurotransmitters, uh, receptors in our GI tract than any other organ system in the body, so it is accurate to call it a second brain. But the point is that um, we can replete and have an overabundance of healthy flora, which we need to be able to absorb and assimilate those excellent micronutrients and phytochemicals in the good foods you're eating. I won't go to sea vegetables, but there is even a property that Harvard Medical recognized in good sea vegetables. I don't talk fresh seaweeds 39 years ago. I thought I was doing the right thing by going to a Japanese market and buying s fresh seaweed and rinsing the salt off. 
but we need to know that the those plants have been that we're going to be eating have been cultivated and harvested from clean water. But I won't go through more details on that, just as examples. And then, of course, appropriate physical activity and fitness practices are essential. Um, sometimes people have lost weight after surgery, etc., but they also lose lean tissue or muscle mass. And we know that, first of all, the ratio of lean to fat when controlling for water weight is um, absolutely connected to key immune factors. But also, when we lose our sense of strength, that's something that we identify in our bodies. And we don't feel as physically strong. Remember, these dimensions are connected, so sometimes mentally we don't feel as strong. Sometimes there's a depletion of emotional stamina. And so there are many things that interconnect. And when we're physically active appropriately during the day, our bodies produce more adenosine, which is what the brain uses to induce good deep sleep, phase three, four. So all these interconnections with seemingly separate health factors in a biochemical um, program. Um, the other thing is sometimes, I think, in our society, we tend to put flexibility at the back of the shelf of physical fitness, but it is essential to our health at every age and stage. And there are other issues that are biomedically related. And then sometimes for people coming out of surgery or sometimes they're receiving certain drugs that contribute to peripheral neuropathy, we don't feel or they don't feel as you would say in our language physically firmly footed or solidly grounded. If we don't physically feel that way, we can feel wobbly in other dimensions. But not only that, we know that it's critical to have good balance because sometimes we will make unconscious compensatory adjustments that can have certain injuries and problems in the body. Um, finally, I definitely am talking to you about sleep habits and patterns. I was trained by a man who developed a whole method at Harvard Medical and researched it. I was really fortunate to study with him. And it's about enhancing what we know as sleep efficiency. So when we go to bed with the intention of getting restorative rest, it's more likely. And I will come back to that. And finally, the importance of having a daily practice that produces what Dr. Herbert Benson identified as the relaxation response back in the mid-70s, meaning it is a measurable, objectively measurable, physiological and biochemical change in the body that we tend to experience more subjectively. But I'm going to come back to research at Harvard that showed that an everyday practice of these relaxation response techniques could produce a change in gene expression that inhibit cancer-promoting factors. So that's kind of the roundup. Um, this is a, a woman who came in, actually, and could barely stand up. But you see that she's doing some appropriate aerobic sitting, even on a recumbent bike, because as mentioned that we have witnessed, Keith has been noting, and we have witnessed clinically when people do appropriate aerobic activity, let's say for 10 minutes before an infusion, or even concurrent with that infusion. Um, even walking around our clinic is good, but that there seems to be a reduction in toxicities and side effects that may be up to about 25%. Keith noted that. So, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about the impact of the stress response um, in terms of affecting cancer. So we know that the effects of the stress response processes interact actually um, with cancer cells. And what I mean is, I can't see what that says. Oh my gosh. I thought I was going to have 37 minutes. Oh my gosh. All right, well, anyway, so it can, like, the production of um, the glucocorticoids, uh, like cortisol, and the 
Catecholamines like adrenaline can actually make a cancer cell much more and cancer tumor more aggressive. Um, it's, I can't go through these. I will hurry. I'm so sorry, but I will be available to talk. Um, but what about unrelieved uh, stress or distress? They're linked to all of these. Oh, goodness, I am struggling to try to hurry. Um, so I won't go through the whole list, but you can see that there's this impact. And the important thing is chronic stress can turn an existing cancer into a more aggressive disease, but a sim systematic biobehavioral program can counter the cancer proneme promoting impact of the stress hormones and help boost a patient's survival odds. So stress, that doesn't mean that we're gnawing on a steering wheel or holding our head all day, but it can be this, quietly worried, distressed about bills to pay, job security, surgery concerns. And there's a freelance writer who really nailed one of the issues with scanxiety. He says he has a love-hate relationship with the scans. Um, I can't go through that, but you can understand that for anybody going in for retesting all the time. Um, a friend, this is self-explanatory, but a friend or a patient who had come out of her ma'am, she got this card and sent it to me, and she says, if women ran the world, the prospect of a manogram. All right, quickly. Oh, I'm racing through this, but the heightened fight-or-flight response that happens so easily with so many things in life. Some people tell me they have no stress because they've retired. Come on, do they have to pay bills? You know, do taxes, do they care about others who are having difficulties? But these catecholamines enable a malignant cell to escape primary tumor site, and it protects those breakaway cells, that adrenaline from being destroyed by apoptosis, and it also increases the speed the adrenaline, if it's repetitive, of distant metastases from primary breast tumors, a 37-fold increase in lung mets, a 67 increase in the lymph nodes. I'm going to skip the animal study. They do animal studies to test stopping the stress hormones. Certainly, they're not going to use humans and stress them more and see if tumor increases. So. Um, how prevalent is psychological distress vary as much, well, as much as 50% of cancer patients experience substantial distress, and I, racing, racing. Um, the key clinical question from authors of this research is, are there ways to inhibit stress-induced tumor growth or decrease immune downregulation? The emphatic answer is yes. Um, one example is dependable social support and daily relaxation practices. Women, this was a ovarian cancer, well, it's a whole body now of research of women with ovarian cancer, stage two to four, who have what's known as dependable support, meaning others who um, actually might do different things, make different medical decisions or different medical um, health behavior changes, that, but respect the patient's decisions and they had daily relaxation techniques. They had dramatically lower levels of VEGF, um, vascular endothelial growth factor. When it's elevated, not good. It contributes to angiogenesis, as you know, or um, vascularization of new cancer sites. But these women had dramatically lower levels of VEGF, which is to say our psychosocial spiritual well-being is interconnected with um, these molecular factors that can lead to better health versus cancer. Um, just an example of a simple re relaxation practice, progressive muscle relaxation. I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with this. I don't have time to describe. But it's a simple activity. And they found in, a nat in an RCT, which is randomized control trial, and we all know that's the gold standard of the modern scientific method, that those who practice a simple technique actually had were able to produce an increase in number and strength of activity of a natural killer cells. And those are the troops of the immune system that lies or disintegrate cancer cells. And someone today just spoke to me about that, one of our patients. I have to skip. I want to close at least this part. I'm not even having time to talk to you about sleep and correcting mistaken notions about that. Um, but this is a really important eight-week study, and here's where I will close, unfortunately. Um, 
this was a study inspired by Dr. Herbert Benson, who I mentioned established the Institute of Mind-Body Medicine at Harvard and identified the relaxation response. And in this really important study with astonishing evidence, it was an eight-week study, and the researchers were investigating 2,200 gene expressions. That's not a genetic predisposition, but how those genes behave in our body. And they found that in this really important eight-week study, those who practice their technique every day, those are operative words, every day, and the researchers wanted it to be 20 minutes. It averaged only 17 and a half minutes. But those who practiced every day, they could see on heat maps they were making a change in gene expression that inhibited what we know to be cancer-promoting factors. For instance, those who practiced every day and they could see these on heat maps. You know, it's upregulated and downregulated in the body. It stopped the whole NF-kappa beta inflammatory cascade or those inflammatory chemicals that you know are highly implicated. And it re-regulated insulin and blood sugar. And we know that glycemic dysregulation is highly relevant promoter of cancer. Um, there are various approaches to produce the relaxation response or the RR. I'm not going to go through the list and I do apologize. Those are the heat maps they could see it on. I don't, I guess, have time to talk about sleep, um, but I need to tell you that we do not need to have continuous sleep. That's a mistaken imperative the media perpetuates because we humans are biphasic or multiphasic. That means that we can sleep an hour and a half, three hours, four and a half hours, and that's fine. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Whew. I don't think I ever talked this fast. Um, yes, I started to say that. And I mentioned those specific time increments because we know as humans we go through all the different phases in a full sleep cycle in approximately an hour and a half. And then we recycle again and again. And it was terrific when the BBC did a series on sleep and they had obviously looked at what we would call medical anthropology because they found historically and culturally, globally today, that those that there is a cultural norm in many societies they refer to as first sleep and second sleep, and sometimes there is social hour between first sleep and second sleep, which is to say it doesn't need to be continuous. The only problem is if you get up let's say, and go to the bathroom. If you go back to bed and you're lying in bed for more than 15 minutes, what you estimate, don't fixate on a clock, of course. We know that, particularly as we get closer to the early morning hours when we're going to get up, that the edge of exhaustion's off, but our mind is very busy. So we go to our to-do list. Am I making the best medical decision? We worry about others we care about. And when we're doing that, we're problem solving. And when we problem solve, our brainwave patterns are speeding up. But you know to get into those different phases in a full sleep cycle, brainwave patterns have to slow down, slow down, slow down. So sometimes I suggest downloading a soothing voice, like a Bella Ruth Dapperstack or some other. She's a licensed clinical social worker who does guided imagery for sleep. Um, because when we have someone else's soothing voice, we can't hear the chatter in our own heads. And then as you start, excuse me, to feel a little bit, if you will, drowsy, because maybe even getting out of bed is good when you haven't fallen back to sleep, if it occurs more than once every other week, sometimes it's what happens is we're very good at conditioning ourselves as human beings to start to see the bed in the bedroom as a place for restlessness during those hours rather than restfulness. So go to a comfortable sofa, for instance. Make sure your neck is supported. Put a bolster under your knees, because remember, if there's tension in your body, it will produce mental tension. And then as you start to feel drowsy, go back to bed. We all know the sleep hygiene tips, meaning the room has to be absolutely dark and cool not warmer than 68 to 70. You don't need to be chilled. Wear, have a comforter. But the ambient temperature shouldn't be higher 
because the air that hits your nostrils and your cheeks should be cool because when we're deep sleep, phase three, four, our internal body temperature is at its coolest. So you're just doing something that's more conducive to deep sleep. And we don't absolutely, it's not an imperative to have eight hours of sleep. Um, there's a landmark population study, University of California, on 1.1 million adults. And they found on average that those, when they were looking at the link between sleep patterns and median survival during these six years of this study, that those who slept seven hours on average seemed to be doing better than many people who were doing eight, which is not to say eight is bad, it's just to say it's not necessary. So, and six hours was better than nine. Um, and I can't get to it, but people my age who are often sleeping better than nine hours, it's usually because of ill health, but many people are rebuilding, so this is not, there are no imperatives in that. Um, I did have a sleep blog I've got to update, because there's new information, and I had a subheading in my last one that sounds glib, but I really meant it to be reassuring. I wrote, don't lose sleep over losing sleep. <laughs> um, so just quick summary, biobehavioral program is changing your microenvironment to inhibit cancer. Um, it's not about, it, yes, helps us feel better, but also get better. In other words, um, we can implement specific approaches as routines to help stop a cancer from becoming more aggressive while simultaneously enhancing genuine health. I do want to close on this with my definition of hope, and I hate rushing through this, but my definition is really the belief in the possible in the face of uncertainty. Thus, there can be no such thing as false hope. Since life itself, by day by day, we all know has uncertainty, and we all need hope, or we couldn't, wouldn't, get out of bed in the morning, and we certainly wouldn't let our youngest daughter drive the freeways in Los Angeles when she was a high school intern there. Anyway, I close on that, and thank you for your patience. Oh, there also, can I just add, there is a Serenity PM it's with a C, C-E-R-E-N-I-T-Y. It is not a problem. It won't interfere with anything. It's probably, it's mainly 5-HTP, which has a good research in terms of helping sleep. Um, and then there's magnesium and micronutrients, and it is safe. If it weren't, one of our grandsons uses it, and I don't think I'd be real comfortable about it. So you can, the only thing is if you order it, the bottle dosage says four capsules. I think one or two really will do the job. Anyway. Way past that. Blend. It has all natural supplements like L theanine, passion fire, chamomile, but it's an oral spray. You just put 12 sprays in your mouth at nighttime. And it's a wonderful blend for anybody uh, experiencing insomnia. And also, there's an amino acid called L theanine, which is like it just puts your body into a whole state of relaxation. You can take like 200 to 400 milligrams of L theanine and you're just you're out. So it's just a relaxing. Anyway, thank you. <laughs>